Presenting Polyptotongue's Glue. We turn now to Shakespeare's sonnets in the 1609 quarto. This video will upset many top Shakespearean scholars because I provide proof that sonnets in the 1609 quarto have a hidden logical order. The editors of this book, All the Sonnets of Shakespeare, Sir Stanley Wells and Dr. Paul Edmondson, claim the sonnets can be read in any order. The poet's own words prove they are mistaken. Rhetoric and how arguments are presented were so important to Renaissance writers that Marcus Fabinius or Fabianus Quintilian's 12 books on rhetoric were widely published all over Europe. And here we see the title page of a 1567 Venetian edition. The rhetorical figures of Polyptoton, Anaphora, Marismos, the newly coined Homostoecos, and others glue many sequential sonnets together. This means we must read them in the same order as published in the 1609 quarto. To be fair to skeptics, we look for at least three connections. One connection might be the result of chance or randomness. Two might be a coincidence. Three or more shows deliberate intent. Let's begin with sonnets five and six. Rather than read out each sonnet because it would take us a long time to get through this presentation, I'm going to dive right in. Anyone who has a facsimile of the 1609 quarto, please just pick it up now and we'll start. You can also download facsimiles or scans of it from the Internet Archive. So without further ado, We'll begin. The word fair glues the poems together using polyptoton. Polyptoton is the repetition of the same word with the same meaning, but in a different way varying such as case, mood, tense, person, degree, number, and gender. Anytime I present a new rhetorical figure, I will provide the definition at the bottom of the screen. Now, we see fair three different times here. Unfair and fairly are in sonnet five, and fair is in sonnet six. That is an example of the tree assumed to omnia principle in which repetition of three of anything, whether it be a word, a theme, a number, signifies that an important or profound truth is either hidden or being expressed somewhere on the page. And in this case, there's a little clever authorship clue. Add the num line numbers that they appear on. The words winter and summer, summer are also an example of polyptoton. Summer appears twice in sonnet five and once in sonnet six. Winter appears twice in sonnet five and again once in sonnet six. Two more examples of the tree assumed omnia principle. For our third connection, we have the word sweet that appears in both poems. And for a really rather cheeky authorship clue, add the line numbers they appear on. Distillation and distilled, another example of polyptoton. Distillation and distilled appear in sonnet five and distilled appears on sonnet six. Finally, walls of glass 
in Sonnet 5 allude to some vial in Sonnet 6. Now we get Sonnets 8 and 9, an example of polyptyton in the words husband slash husbands. Husbands with an apostrophe S is the possessive. What's interesting about this is the following. Husband appears on line 9 in Sonnet 8. Husbands appears on line 8 in Sonnet 9. And for another numerical authorship clue, add the line numbers. Our second clue is women's roles. It's an example of marismos. Marismos is where something is described or referenced in its entirety. And in Renaissance and medieval times, a woman could be a mother, a wife, and a widow. Child slash children's, again with an apostrophe S yes, in the proper grammatical way, is another example of polyptyton. Being single, the theme of being single, is an example of exergasia. Exergasia is restating a point in different words. Thou single, from line 14 in Sonnet 8, is a direct reference to single life in Sonnet 9. My next example is going to be very controversial, but I will get to this in a later video. I contend that both poems are using the rhetorical figure of eleism. Eleism is referring to oneself in the third person. Again, I'm going to get back to that in a future video. Sonnets 17 and 18 were covered in my video, Sweet Summer's Child. Viewers are encouraged to go to that one to get the background behind these rhetorical connections. Heaven is an example of polyptyton. Heaven knows and heavenly touches from Sonnet 17 refer directly to heaven shines in Sonnet 18. The word life is an example of polyptyton and what I call homostoikos. Homostoikos is where the same word or theme is present in the same line in adjacent poems. I have not seen this in any other collection of poems. It may be unique to the sonnets and something for the authorship game exclusively. So we have life and live in sonnet 17 and lives in sonnet 18. Again, homostoikos, the same word or theme is present in the same line in adjacent poems. Here is a second form of homostoikos in polyptyton. The plural of I is in sonnet 17, and the singular form is on sonnet 18, and they both appear in line 5. Sonnets 26 and 27 are connected through the word thought or thoughts. It's an example of polyptyton. Thy soul's thought in Sonnet 26 connects to my thoughts in Sonnet 27. Ambassage from Sonnet 26 and pilgrimage from Sonnet 27 are both allusions, allusions rather, to voyages that have a purpose. Ambassage is where an envoy or ambassador travels to another country and negotiates with a government on behalf of their own government. And of course, a pilgrimage is a journey to a sacred site to obtain spiritual merit. Our third connection is the word star in the poem or Sonnet 26, rather, alludes to Black Knight in Sonnet 27. 
you can't get stars shining unless there's some darkness. Star that glides, guides rather, in Sonnet 26, alludes to a journey in my head in Sonnet 27. And also a zealous pilgrimage to thee, to thee rather, in the same sonnet. Tottered loving also alludes to a journey in my head. And a zealous pilgrimage to thee. Next. Sonnets 34 and 35 are an example, have an example of Polyptoton, the word cloud or clouds. Base clouds and the cloud from Sonnet 34 relate to clouds in Sonnet 35. The plural also appears in line three in both poems for another example of homostoikos. The word salve is an example of polyptoton and homostoikos. They both appear in line seven. Salve and salving. Next, we have allusions to the law for our fourth set of connections. Offenders in Sonnet 34 allude to advocate in Sonnet 35. Or we have offenses from Sonnet 34, alluding to a lawful plea commence. Once again, this is an example of how the playwright and poet could use legal terms in such a way to ex ex expose you to his, or demonstrate rather, his legal knowledge. Sonnets 44 and 45, thought is an example of polyptoton. Were thought, nimble thought, think and not thought from Sonnet 44 absolutely connects to my thought in Sonnet 45. The next connection is very important. The four humors slash elements, another example of merismos. In medieval and Renaissance psychology, people were typed according to humors, and there were four of them. Each of the humors were comprised of mixture of the four elements. So here we have in Sonnet 44, earth and water, which are, were considered to be slow elements. And Sonnet 45 has air and fire, which are considered to be quicker elements, as they say, as it says in line five in Sonnet 45. And of course, they are also swift messengers. My life being made of four, which is in the yellow box in Sonnet 45, describes how the elements and the four humors comprise a person's life, according to the physiology and psychology of the time. The theme of sadness to give us our third connection is both appear, appears in both poems on line 14. Sonnet 44 has woe, Sonnet 45 has sad. And in an example of proof that these poems must be read in the same order, we have a reverse illusion in the phrase, the other two in Sonnet 45, and it is grammatically important because you cannot mention the other two, air and fire as elements in the same line in Sonnet 45 without previously mentioning earth and fire in a sonnet beforehand. It is impossible to do that, unless of course you want your readers to go flipping back and forth between the pages, and that's just not what the purpose of the sonnets was about.
Sonnets 46 and 47 are definitely connected through mine eye and heart. The phrase appears in line one in both poems and another example of homo stoicos. My heart, bracket, hearts, another example of polypteton. And another example of homo stoicos. My heart's in sonnet 46 is on line 14. My heart in sonnet 47 is also on line 14. Sonnets 53 and 54 are connected through beauty in an example of polyptyton. Shades and painting, another example of polyptyton and illusion. Shade, shadow, and shadow. Shadow being a noun and an adverb from Sonnet 53. Allude to painted in the same sonnet, which again connects to the word dye, as in coloring a fabric with pigment in Sonnet 54. And both of these poems allude to costume. Line 8 in Sonnet 53 goes, and you in Grecian tires are painted new. A direct reference to actors on stage. Because actors would go behind the curtain to what was called a tiring room in which they changed their costume or their attire. And of course, when they did that, they would be painted new because, of course, they'd be in different costume. Line 8 in Sonnet 54 reads, When summer's breath their masked buds discloses, or we could say their masked blood buds discloses, sorry. It is an, uh, an allusion to how in ancient Greek drama, all the performers wore masks. Perhaps not the choruses, but I believe all the main characters did. This would never have been taught in grammar schools, but would have been the subject or topic of advanced study in the history of drama. Beauty is in Sonnet 67, 68, and 69, another example of polypteton. And here's something interesting. I call these links of beauty. Because if you look at Sonnet 68, it connects to the outlying sonnets, the sonnets either side of it two different ways. Poor beauty in Sonnet 67 connects to beauty lived in Sonnet 68. What beauty was of your can in Sonnet 68 connects to Beauty of Thy Mind in Sonnet 69, but the middle sonnet, of course, connects a second way to those two poems. Next we have painting and dying. It's a metaphor and an illusion again. And it's in the same order as the previous group of sonnets. Painting in Sonnet 67 precedes dyed, D-Y-E-D, -E which is the color of fabric using pigment in Sonnet 68. They belong to Sonnet 69 because I will demonstrate that they are all part of an extended metaphor. Sixty-seven and sixty-eight are connected through the past, the theme of the past, and another example of exergasia. Days long since, in the line seventeen, uh, line fourteen, rather, of sonnet sixty-seven, lead directly to the first line of sonnet sixty-eight, with days out warm. You can actually switch these out for each other, and you'd still get the same meaning. I, for example, in days long since, can easily read in days outworn. 
days that worn in Sonnet 68 could easily be days long since. They share the same rhythm. Finally, for the extended metaphor, we have the theme of flowers. Roses and rose from Sonnet 67 connect to flowers in Sonnet 68, which connects to flower in Sonnet 69. And they're also connected to parts of the head. But is this a true example of marismos? Well, we have cheek mentioned in Sonnet 67 and 68. 68 shows tresses or hairs of the head, and of course, head. Sonnet 69 has eyes and tongues. Notice how I and eyes are spelled two different ways. E-Y-E twice in Sonnet 69 and E-I-E-S in so as the plural in the same sonnet. This is another example of how a spelling error or spelling difference shows you that something is going on beneath the surface of the poems and you have to look more carefully. The reason I ask, is this a true example of a marismos? Where are the ears? They're not ear. And finally, his cheek, whoops. His cheek, sorry, let's go back here. I uh, can't go back. But anyways, his cheek appears in Sonnet 67 and 68. And stores, the word stores, another example of Polyptoton and Homo Suicos. We have six different connections here between these poems, so they must be read in this order. Sonnet 71 and 72 have the rep triple repetition of O, showing the example of the tree assumed omnia principle again, and they are examples of anaphora and asterismos. Anaphora is the repetition of words at the start of successive clauses, phrases, or sentences. And in the case of these sonnets, they don't have to be one right at top of the other, one right before the other. Asterismos is the use of a prefix word to draw attention to subsequent words. Readers of this play Romeo and Juliet will know exactly what I mean when he uses it many, many, many times. We have the triple appearance of least. Actually, it is lest. And again, the Trius and Omnia principle applies. We also have the quadruple repetition of world in both of these poems. And finally, we have an allusion to speech in both of them. We have the word rehearse in Sonnet 71 and recite in 72. And again, we have an example of grammar, or at least the meaning of words will give you the order in which the poems must be read. In order to recite something, as you see in Sonnet 72, as alluded to in 72, you must rehearse it, as we see in Sonnet 71 with my poor name, Rehearse. There's no way you can get out of this one. They have to be read in this order. Sonnets 87, 88, and 89, the word for, F-O-R, appears four times. It's an example of anaphora again. They appear in the first lines, or the first words, sorry, of different lines. They're also a homophone of the number four. Homophones are words that are spelled differently and have the same or very similar pronunciation. Furthermore, it is a pun, a double pun. F-O-R is a pun on F-O-U-R. It appears four different times. And it's a pun on the true author's last name. And is this a quaternity concealed within a ternary, as I explained in some first folio puzzles 
or enigmas solved. We have four words within three poems that are pun, example of anaphora, and a homophone. For the next two connections, we have merit and faults. Merit, or deserving, is a, an example of akolautha. Akolautha is the substitution of reciprocal words where each word could be substituted in each other's context. My deserving from Sonnet 87 could be my merit in Sonnet 88, and vice versa. The meaning of the lines would never change if you switch deserving and merit around. And the word false, another example of polyptyton. We have the plural in Sonnet 88 and singular in Sonnet 89. Sonnets 97 and 98 are connected through the word yet, another example of anaphora and an example of the Tria Symptomnia principle. It appears three times at the beginning of lines. Second example of anaphora, the word from. From thee on line two in Sonnet 97, from you on line one in Sonnet 98. And this is another example, perfect example rather, of Akalasa, because you can substitute thee and you for each other and not change the meaning of the word or the lines rather. <clears throat> Finally, we have the theme of the poet's absence, both appear, which appear on line one in both poems. My absence and have I been absent are on line one in these poems. Again, polyptyton and homostoikos. Sonnets 104 and 105, we have the word fair that appears four times. It's another double pun. And in a sneaky little authorship clue or puzzle clue, you add the line numbers that these appear on. Fair, kind, and true in Sonnet 105, perfect example of anaphora. The phrase actually begins three different lines in the poem. And the answer to the line sum clue is 33, which is suggestive of the truth. Three appears seven times. It's an example of parasologia and anaphora. Parasologia is the excessive use of words, and I cover that in Polyptyton's glue. Well, sorry, I cover that in For My Name Is Will, Part 1. Viewers are encouraged to see that video to see how Parasologia works to give us a riddle. Sonnets 116 and 117. I cover in the curious case of true love and unknown minds. And the word prove is an example of polyptyton and homostoikos. Proved and prove appear on line 13 in both poems. The word minds is an example of epistrophe. Epistrophe is where a set of lines, phrases, clause, or sentences end with the same word or words. For another cheeky little authorship clue, count the number of lines between minds. We have a repetition of the word unknown. The word error is an example of polyptyton again. Our fifth connection, we have allusion to the weather, tempests and all the winds. We also have 
An example of Homo Stoicos in the theme of sailing, wandering bark and hoisted sail appear on line 7 in both poems. Coincidentally, there are seven terms for navigation throughout these poems, and this is the seventh connection. We also have the theme of vision in both poems, with looks and sight. Both poems have allusions to permanence. The first one has fixed mark. The second one has constancy. Our tenth connection, we have love, which is repeated, of course, and it's an example of what I call a panadilepsis. It's a term I coined because I've never seen this rhetorical figure in the literature. A panadilepsis is where the same word begins one line and ends another line further on in a poem or in the next poem. They do not have to be in the same line number. I may be mistaken, but I've never encountered this before in a collection of poems. If anybody knows of a, perf a more proper rhetorical figure, mention it in the comments and I'll look into it. I cover sonnets 125 and 126 in my video Bearing the Canopy and Holding Time's Fickle Glass. In fact, time, the theme, is an example of Marismos and Exergasia in these two poems. Time can be described as eternity and the smallest units of time are seconds, minutes, and hours. The word sweet is an example of a siren, antiphrasis, and irony. A siren, that's S-A-C-Y-R-O-N, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, is where a word is used which is opposite to the normal word that should be applied. Antiphrasis is the use of words in a sense opposite to its real meaning. And of course, irony occurs where there is incongruity between what is said, done, meant, or perceived. The word sweet in Sonnet 126 does not mean the same thing as in Sonnet 127, as I explained in, the, in my earlier video. Sweet is not nice in this poem. In fact, the same terms apply to lovely boy. He's meaning it I very ironically. To hammer the point home, the word render is an example of, of atanaclasis, antiphrasis, and homostoikos. Antanaclasis is the repetition of a word where the word has different meanings each time. It also describes antiphrasis. In Sonnet 125, the word means to give something to someone, like rendering aid or help or assistance or rendering unto thee. In Sonnet 126, however, it means to tear apart, as in rendering a carcass or rendering someone limb from limb. Finally, the words control and power are an example of exergasia and akalavtha. Control and power mean exactly the same thing, and it, control appears in line 14 in Sonnet 125, and immediately after that in line 1 in Sonnet 126 is power. And you could switch those words around and still maintain the same meaning of the lines. I cover sonnets 134, 135, and 136 extensively in for nine, My Name is Will, Part 1. And here I'm going to give you the rhetorical connections. Sonnet 
thy will is an example of of pistrophe because they appear on the final phrases in three different lines here and tanaclasis because will with the lowercase w and not in italics does not mean the same as will with an uppercase w and in italics and sonnets 134 and 136 have an example of homostoicos thy will appears on line two in both poems Next, we have still, an example of epistrophe again. And like the earlier trio of puzzles, or poems rather, Sonnet 135 in the middle is connected to the other two exactly the same way twice. It's also an example of the Tria Sonctonia principle, not just once. but twice. And of course the word will is an example of perisologia, polyptyton, epistrophe, and epanadilepsis. Our second last pair of sonnets are sonnets 143 and 144. And the first thing I noticed about this pair of sonnets is that it contains a very unusual pattern. And I don't know what kind of rhetorical figure this could be, and I have not the skills in ancient Greek to figure it out, or even Greek. You'll notice in sonnet 143, the word one appears in line two. Sonnet 144, the word two appears in line one. Intuitively, instinctively, I know that these two poets have to be connected simply because of that pattern. Again, what sort of rhetorical figure it is, I have no idea. Speaking of things that are odd, Low and 1 in sonnet 143 are above each other, and I have no idea right now why OE is above ONE. I'll be doing a video on these two sonnets in the future, and maybe by then I'll have it figured out. As in an earlier pair of sonnets, we have Woman and Marismos. Housewife and mother are two roles that women can have. They're in Sonnet 143. And Sonnet 144 has woman and female. IND is rhyme that connects Sonnets 143 and 144. We have behind, kind, find, and is this a partial rhyme with friend? The word still, another example of epistrophe, and it connects directly to sonnets 134, 135, and 136. And thy will connects sonnet 143 to 144, 35, and 36. And notice that 143 and 134, the last two digits are reversed. And again, it's epistrophe and antenna classes. For our final pair of poems, we have sonnets 152 and 153. The word I is an example of polyptyton. Notice how in sonnet 153, Mistress I, as it's spelled in the beginning, is different than Mistress I, that's spelled on line 14. We have E-I-E -E and E-Y-E. -E. Yet again, another example of how a spelling anomaly will lead people to understand that something else is going on beneath the surface of the poem. Perjured Eye in line 13 in Sonnet 152 alludes to Mistress Eye in Sonnet 153. 
for our third connection, we have seven legal terms alluding to trial. The seven legal terms in Sonnet 152 are a perfect example of how the author had extensive legal knowledge that had to have been acquired through constant practice and learning the law. Here is a chart summarizing everything that we've gone through. We have seen 39 sonnets, or 25.3% of the sonnets, connected by 81 rhetorical figures in 18 different groups. 72.2% or 13 of these sonnets are what I call digit sum sonnets or digit sum pairs. And a digit sum pair is where the sum of the digits of the sonnets add up to our target number 17. The same number of sonnets are connected through polyptyton. 55.5% are connected through allusions. Homo stoicos connects 50% of these sonnets. Antiphrasis connects 33.9%. Epistrophe connects 27.7%. Merismos connects 22.2%. Puns connect 16.7%. Homophones connect 11.1%. And all of the others, exergasia, repetition, metaphors, grammar, epanodilepsis, parisologia, Antenna classes and rhyme connect 66.7%. These are numbers, these are figures you cannot dispute because you can count everything here. So, the editors of this book, published in 2020, Sir Stanley Wells and Dr. Paul Edmondson, claim the sonnets can be read in any order. I hope I have proven that the old poet's own words and rhetorical figures prove that they are mistaken. For more information on rhetorical figures, visit changingminds.org slash techniques slash language slash figures underscore speech slash figures underscore speech underscore alpha dot html. And for your convenience, here is a glossary showing all of the rhetorical figures that we have found in these poems. And if you are going to use a panodilepsis or homostoikos in a paper or presentation, please credit me because like the original author of these sonnets and stuff, it would be nice to get credit. Thanks for watching, everybody. Stay safe. <laughs>